Then Time for some video games, day. I would say. Yes! <laughs> Exactly. Um, yeah, we're so lucky to have Forrest Anderson from um, who will be presenting Valoran to us. Hello. There hello. we go. Hi. Um, so you're joining us from from Ottawa? Yes, in Canada. All the way a few hours back from you guys. <laughs> cool. <Sweet>. Time traveler. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, so can I just hop right into it? Or is there anything else I uh, need to preface with? No, please do. I think All you right. can go. I think it'll be great to see more. So let's make the awesome. most of it. Good stuff. So yeah, thank you so much for uh, for having me. Um, I'm part of the team that's working on a game called Valoran. And it's been in progress for about two or three years so far, since like mid-2018. And um, it's one of the largest games that's built completely in Rust. And so it's a really awesome sort of show of what Rust can do from like the, the top to bottom. And so later I'll go into the technical side a little bit about like what uh, like a lot of the, the, the back end uses and everything. But um, for a lot of like sort of this talk, what I want to be exploring is sort of the art of Valoran. And so um, it's, it's uh, very interesting because we we often do like tech talks. We're like approached by people who are like, hey, we don't think that Rust can, like it's really surprising that Rust can do it. How do you do it? Um, but for this mm -hmm. one, I'm gonna do like a, a whole, uh, but like like top to bottom of some of like the really interesting things that we can do in Valoran that we don't really see in many other games. And so especially like if we think to what we see right on the screen right now, so I'm gonna cheat a little bit. And so right right now, actually kind of interesting, there's like 54 players on the on this server right now. And so I can see them walk around the world and everything. Um, but since I'm an admin, I'm gonna change the time to morning so that we get a little bit of light going on here. <laughs> um, so everybody else in chat's gonna be like, oh, what's going on? It's so weird, but that's fine. Uh, we're doing a presentation and so, uh, what we see right here is like a voxel sort of world. So if you know Minecraft, it's very sort of similar aesthetics to that. Um, but we were actually inspired by a different game called Cube World. And so Cube World was first released in like 2012-ish. And uh, since then, it's, it's been a single developer working on it with his wife. And uh, although there's a, a lot of really great gameplay mechanics that everybody loved um, when the, the game first came out, uh, the development speed of it is quite slow. And there was a lot um, sort of to be desired when it came to like what it was capable of. And so in 2018, um, some people got together on Reddit and said, hey, it would be really awesome if you filled an open source version of this and kind of um, took everything that we loved about it and then just made it as open as possible. And three years later, this is what we have. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's been like a really interesting um, sort of process going and setting up this world that, uh, first of all, there, there's a lot of like interesting things that you might not see in uh, in other games. And so, for example, um, like you can see a, like far off in the distance a mountain. And this is something that you wouldn't really get in Minecraft. You can only like see so far into the distance. And then also um, Minecraft does this world generation differently. Um, yeah. You can also see uh, like so, some different stuff on the train. So we've got some pumpkins here. Um, we have like a lot of world simulation going on to, to set up a lot of stuff. And so, um, yeah, I just want to make sure that I, I have like a whole talk plan, but do you guys have any questions for me or any, any way that you want me to lead the, uh, the discussion in the game? I just want to chime in. I've, I've been like gasping, like, because you turned the camera and then we saw this amazing, adorable village and the mountain way far off. And I'm like, well, that's yeah. not fair. You can't just dro <laughs> drop that on <laughs> It is quite surprising. And so I'll do another little surprise here. So here, first of all, let's take a look at the map. And so um, as we can see, we got like mountains, uh, we can explore a lot of different like lakes, we can explore, explore a lot of different woods. But as you see, like the map is a finite size. And so once we get to the mm -hmm. edge, that's the ocean beyond that. And so the reason behind this, um, I'll talk a little bit about the world generation system. Yeah, please. And so uh, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. And so in Minecraft, you have this idea of chunks that like load in around you. And I can we can yeah. see right here that right past this boundary, this is where the chunks have stopped loading. And as I start walking in this direction, it will start um, loading chunks in over here. I'm going through water, so it can be a little bit slower. Um, but then eventually the server uh, will start sending me new chunks. Um, but then what I also want to do is keep zooming out even further. And so what we can see is that the world that I'm in is incredibly expansive. And uh, we got like mountains off in the distance. We got like, we, we can see that just like a lake over here and everything like that. And so we're using a lot of really interesting techniques to generate this terrain, but also generate the features around the world. Um, and then if I go even further, we can see that like the, the, we are on an island, in fact, and we got clouds everywhere. And so this is one of the things that is kind of like very mind blowing when you like see like this type of scale. Um, and I, I will warn you, it gets a little bit glitchy as we go further out, but you can go to infinity, but I won't do that. It's, uh, it gets a little weird. But anyways, let's, oh, let's go infinity back. Infinity is just a little glitchy. Sorry. It, yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, and so we have uh, quite an expansive world that we do a lot of special generation on. And so from the beginning of like when you start up a world, um, you'll have uh, world being generated. Like we, we saw in some previous talks talking about um, stuff like Perlin noise. And so this is a really great way to do a lot of generation for these types of procedural games. But then one really big thing that it misses out on is that it's very, very difficult, if even possible, to simulate things like lakes and oceans. And the reason for this is that when you have rivers, you want your rivers to be going downhill and eventually culminate in some type of body of water. And so in Valoran, we have this, um, this, this idea that during the world generation phase, you can go through a large step of generating mountains and then doing like millions of years of erosion on these mountains. And then erosion then turns into rivers, which rivers combine together to turn into lakes. And so we had a ton of developers working on this type of um, world generation system. But then the benefit of it is that we can build a world ahead of time. And we can see this mountain off in the distance over here. And I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to... Um, even though I'm on the multiplayer server, I do have some of the, uh, the the special special tools to get around. So I'm just gonna fly up over here, and we're gonna go take a look at this mountain over here. And so, um, with our mountains off in the distance, I I'll just stop right here as an example. And so, as the terrain starts to come in, we don't actually render all of the terrain ahead of time. That would be like that would be like so many voxels. It'd be terrible on your computer and everything. But we can um, get a level of detail, like a lower level of detail version of it. And so, for example, uh, we saw the lake off in the distance over here, and as we approach it, the, the boundaries of the lake will actually look like this, even though they're not rendered in just yet. And so it's very easy for the server to send this like type of map um, in this way. And so like, if, if I go over to the mountain over here, um, the mountain will start rendering in. Now, normally, since you're walking, you're not going to you're not gonna see it as jarring as what I'm doing right now. But we can see that we have all the trees. I'll go up to the top of the mountain. Um, and... We'll be able to land here as soon as it starts loading in chunks. All right. So now I'm at the top of the mountain. I can see like warm from the top of the world. Uh, let's go time dust. So, All right. So, so if you don't mind me. Yeah. Um, everything's kind of predefined. Because, because so, I mean, you mentioned Minecraft. So I just, I, I gotta. For sure. You know. <laughs> Sometimes you get, you know, like you, 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 it loads in a chunk and there's like a little floating hobbit hole in the middle of the ocean because it, it like it knows that there's supposed to be land there, but there isn't. So you'll get like random floating things like trees on fire in the middle of the air. And like, it doesn't seem like you all have that problem. So everything's kind of, you know, set yeah. and then loaded in. So th this is like a really great thing to explore because when you think of a game like Minecraft, it's designed so that you can go anywhere off into like there's like the, the far lands is what they call like the, the place you get to and you can't go any further because of like integer precision or like floating point precision, I suppose. But what we have is we have a much smaller finite world. Like if you were to walk from one side to another without like all the cheaty stuff, it'd probably take you like half an hour to do. And so it's pretty big, but it's not infinitely large. But then the benefit of limiting, limiting it to this size is first of all, for the erosion that we do, um, you're not able to perform this erosion on an infinite scale. And so um, let's say like I, I didn't, so I, I have this this map right here. If, if the map continued up above it, I wouldn't be able to know how mountains up there would affect rivers down here if I didn't pre-render it. And I didn't like do those like preemptive calculations of what the mountains look like. And then further, um, we have a lot of cities. And so we, we, we started in a town. Um, and one of the really cool underlying systems that we're working on is this... Um, real-time world simulation and real-time economy simulation that will be able to sort of design how towns are built. And so uh, we're working on stuff like trade routes between towns. We're working on stuff like um, towns that prosper more can be larger and will have like bigger castles and stuff like that. And this all comes down to the idea that if you calculate it ahead of time, then I know how every town is going to interact with one another, but I don't know how this town would interact with some un like invisible, undetermined town off past the boundary of the map. And so it is like an interesting distinction between the two. Mm. All right, I think uh, since since uh, this person followed me over here, I hope they if they add me again. I feel like it's one of the other admins. I just didn't recognize their username. Um, <laughs> it might be Zester. He's uh, he's the one who uh, started the project. But I think there's a, a few other admins who'll be on in in a bit. So uh, next up, what I want what I want to show us is let's go. Um, I'm I'm gonna do Don just so it's a little bit brighter. Okay, perfect. And so uh, we have some really interesting physics that are a part of the game. And so uh, when you jump around, it feels a little bit uh, more laggy in comparison to some other games. 
Um, but if we uh, take a look at the glider system and the physics from it, so as I'm going down, it really feels a lot different than uh, a, a lot of other games that I've played where you have like some type of glider where like the physics of it are really just based on like some very simple abstractions of, of what uh, like physical gliders would actually do. But then for us, like about six months or a year ago or something like that, we had someone come in who calculated all of like the, the buoyancy, the density and like all this magic that makes it so that when you're flying, it actually feels pretty insane. Um, and so we have some like interesting videos that we put out of like you're, you're on like a tall mountain and you can like fly um, down and stuff like that. And so uh, this is like definitely like a, a pretty interesting sort of mechanic that players can uh, can explore. Um, now I've got a dungeon over here. I, I won't go through the dungeon because I don't know how to make my health invulnerable and I will die like right away. And so uh, we, we can take a quick look through though. I have to say, when you were showing us the gliding, at least the very beginning, when you kind of went down, um, I'm really bad with roller coasters. I <laughs> yeah. already felt like a little weird. I felt like a little thing, not, not chills, but something similar. I was already like, oh, wow, that I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's the snow flying up or what. <laughs> yeah. And so I think it's definitely a lot to do with the fact like when you watch it over over a stream, um, you'll get a lot more motion sickness just because it's like lower frame rate and you're not mm. like interacting with the, the glider itself. And so that, I think that's definitely something that you can't really convey as much. But um, yeah, if it, like I, I think as I play it, like it just feels so buttery smooth to sort of like fly down and fly around and stuff like that. Um, I'm not paying attention, but whoever's with me is uh, is protecting me right now, and so that's uh, <laughs> very helpful. <laughs> um, yeah, and so I think another thing that I kind of want to go into is talk about like how the game was created because we have um, a ton of different people who worked on the project, and so I do a lot of the like I write the blog every week, I go to a lot of conferences, I kind of talk about Valoran. Um, but that being said, we've had like well over 200 contributors who have who have done something for the game. And so what this looks like is we'll, we'll have like a, fr a fraction of that be the coders who are in, uh, implementing stuff. We'll have a fraction of that be like the artists and the designers and stuff like that. Um, but there's a lot more positions that actually get filled when you're like just looking for like a, a sort of breadth of what people can do on a project. And so, for example, we have like composers. We have uh, like I just wrote like a list down here. So. Composers, artists, devs, writers, testers, designers, um, but then really importantly as well, since this is an open source project and since we have, like we are the community that's building the game, we have a lot of people who can come to our Discord and have discussions with us about design and can have discussions with us about how things are implemented and um, whether it be technical, whether it be um, artistic or anything like that. And so I think that's like one of the really big powerful things that we have in comparison to like some big AAA games that don't really uh, focus as much um, on like the community first. Um, and so, yeah, oh, we have on GitHub like 200 people tracked. Now there, there might be some duplicates of people who have like multiple Git accounts, um, but then we have a lot of people that are untracked and who have like contributed in a lot of unfathomable ways from like just in the Discord, I think. What, what um, would be interesting to me is then how do you, so is there, what's your decision-making process, right? Yeah. Because like, um, because of a big community, big project, a lot of people with opinions on the internet. Um, how do you handle that? Like, how do you? Because like the outcome is looks great. Uh, so like, yeah, who, who we get to hear yes somehow. No? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And this is like a really interesting dynamic that we have, where we have a lot of developers who come in and contribute certain things. They'll find an issue on our GitLab. They'll they'll fix something up. Um, but then also we try to have, so first of all, a lot of discussion that's sort of siloed off into different working groups. And so, uh, for example, I'm the meta uh, team lead. And so what I do for that is I do stuff like CI, the blog, outreach and stuff like that. But then we also have like a rendering team, a design team, a combat team. And these are people who are very, um, oh cool, I leveled up, that's very awesome. <laughs> um, th these are people who really care about this one part of the game. And they have a lot of discussions. They can have a lot of sort of like figuring out what stuff looks like. Um, but then it, it's still difficult to come up with like what what the central um, like the design voices and pillars are. And so I think we can take a lot from what we've seen in the past. And so, for example, for a lot of combat choices and design choices, we can reference games like Minecraft and Cube World. But then for a lot of stuff that we're sort of trying as new, a lot of it comes as like. Um, each are proposals where people will come in and just have long-term discussions with the, the developers that are here. Um, I'm just going to teleport back home so we don't stay in here for too long. I should be showing up some uh, cool-looking stuff. 
All right. Um, yeah, so we have a lot of people coming in and um, having a lot of different types of discussion in general. But it, it is hard because we do, we're, we're not super centralized. We do have like our team leads. We do have weekly meetings. But um, in terms of like what you'd accept for, expect from like an agile team or um, like really like a team lead to come in and make executive decisions, we really don't have that as much, which is uh, um, something that I've always tried to diagnose myself because it's like how how have we succeeded in what we were attempting without necessarily like what I was told in school needs to be or uh, the, like the way that you do teams. Oh, yes. Uh, whoever whoever's with me who just typed that, can you go to the caves and then teleport me to one? And so I can uh, just chill here and you do all the work. I imagine they'll do it. Um, yeah, so a, f a few other things that I'll show off. We'll just do a quick walkthrough of caves. Um, I'm trying to t uh, take a look. We also have some really cool stuff that happens at night, but I don't know if I'm able to control it as easily. We have like auroras that pop up, so like northern lights type of thing. And it's just like one of our rendering devs just like spent a lot of time making the sky look absolutely amazing. Um, so what I'll actually just do is I'll see if I can like spawn it. Yeah. I'm mid now that you've so, teased it, you kind of like have to. Oh, exactly. Oh, wait. Perfect. It's the first <laughs> oh. try. Okay. And so right now, uh, we we have the uh, the aurora out, and so uh, we can see up in the sky we have, uh, and it only shows up some nights, which is super cool. Uh, oh, it's okay. It is Esther. Uh, uh, is Esther, if you wouldn't mind, can you just uh, type out the if I if I TP, des. Oh, perfect. Work. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so we got a, we got a cave right here. We're gonna explore. Um, so we got the auroras up there. Zester was actually the one to work on the auroras and the clouds, and so um, it, it's like a very nice touch um, to to the night. I think. Oh, for sure. It, I think it's one of those things where you know, as a player, you don't expect it, and then it comes up, and you're just like, your breath is taken away, and then the next yeah. night it doesn't happen, and you're like, well, that was magical. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like one of those sort of rewards that you get that like, yeah, as you mentioned, it, it kind of just pops up. You weren't aware that was going to happen. But it is like, uh, for a lot of things, like the first time I experienced it, like it really blew my mind just how beautiful parts of this game are. Um, and so I, I've definitely experienced that so much. And I mean, even for myself, like I don't play the game super often. Like I write blogs about it. I do a lot of like sort of internal work. Um, but there's definitely a lot of stuff that I go to like a release party and I'm like, this is actually insane that someone worked on this and created this. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind me asking, while we're walking through this cave, um, how does the how um, I would love to hear how the the choice of Rust has affected your contributor base? Like, I think mm -hmm. that's a really, you know, yeah. yeah. I really like <laughs> you know, like what level? Lot. Like what yeah. level are they? Or you know how? Yeah, just. In your own words. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So we have a lot of our community. Um, they, they come from like a Rust background. They're doing maybe Rust at work or they've learned Rust and they want to try it out. But then a lot of people will come to the project without much Rust knowledge and use it as a way to, to get started with a lot of things. And so there's a lot of easy ways to um, sort of be able to implement stuff in the game through config files, through other um, there's like easy sort of entry points um, that yeah, so allow a lot of people to get started. But I think as well, um, in terms of working on such a large team, the, one of the biggest benefits that Rust gives us, and I, there's a talk that happened at Rust uh, Conf this year, and I forget the exact name, but uh, there, there's a point that with Rust, you sign a contract with the compiler. And this is this idea that when you compile code, uh, your code is very likely to do uh, what you wanted it to without that many runtime errors. Of course, you can solve logic errors and everything like that. But we can be very certain that when someone's going to merge code into the game, um, as long as it compiles and we can do like a, a look through and make sure that everything look, looks as we'd expect it to, um, we can be confident that it's going to work quite well. And so I think this barrier really prevents a, a lot of contributors from coming in and then just getting completely shut down because they don't know the idiomatic way to do it in Rust. And so, and, and also, I mean, the Rust community is one of like the, the, the biggest facets of the Rust community is the fact that like everybody is willing to teach everybody else. And so all of our like, like most, like the, the people who know the most about a project and like know everything are always willing to help new contributors, which I find personally amazing. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think there's definitely a lot of reasons. I mean, also Rust is super fast. Like we, we use parallelism a lot, especially on our server. Like the, the most players we've gotten online at once is like 180-ish, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And that was like on like a, a 48 core server in Hetzner and uh, a, a lot of really cool sort of um, benefits that you get from parallelism. Um, but then also just showing that like it can do everything at the, the scale we would want it to. Super cool. 
Yeah. I'm loving the soundtrack. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I'm just know, taking like the, everything in. I... The composers that have worked on this, like, there's so, like, for sound effects, for um, just soundtracks and everything. Like, I, I was going and editing, the, like, the video that I was putting together uh, yesterday for Rust Fest, and I, I found a track that I hadn't listened to yet. I'm like, how do we have music that is this good in the game? Like, in an open source game, it just, it, like, a lot of, well, I'm, I'm a developer, right? Like, I look at code, and I'm like, okay, this is possible. But then when I see what the artists make and what the composers make and what people come up with, it blows my mind that we could have anything like this at all. I think that's the beauty of video games, though, that you have these like interdisciplinary things where, like, you know, there's this artist who's just like, oh, I just made some art, and everybody else who's not an artist is like, oh my god, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And you get this like for music and like for all the other stuff. I really like this about Game Dev. I yeah, think that's absolutely. The thing that's also beautiful about it being it being open source is that everyone will be blown away. I am, I am, I can't get over the fact that you used erosion for the. I <laughs> like, know, just, right? <laughs> I just you know and i'm sure that you know uh while you're chilling to some of the beats in the game they're like how did they do that how did they make that happen so yeah uh, yeah absolutely um and, and so i think every time that we have some complex feature like this like the developer who goes out and works on it really um so for example we have someone who did a lot of the erosion simulation and he referenced a lot of research papers that say like this is like the cutting edge of erosion simulation and stuff like that and same thing with economics um we, we reference a lot of research papers and and then same thing with a lot of the the rendering with a lot of the um uh, yeah, like world simulation and stuff like that. And so it's really, it, it feels like we're doing stuff that's cutting edge and that we have the capability of doing it because we have these experts coming in from all different places to uh, to help us with it. Um, Amazing. Yeah. So we have some monsters here, so I'm going to keep coming away from you. Well, I was going to say, are we not going to talk about the cave troll in the room? <laughs> yeah. I, maybe I might be invulnerable. I, oh, I no. I think I am. <laughs> but if I go in lava, that's, lava's killed me before, and so I know I'm not that invulnerable. So we'll just hang out and watch these nice particle effects, uh, and then try to... Oh, but they're pushing me towards the lava. They're probably so going to push you. They're, they're, yeah, they're yeah, a bit clever, yeah. I guess. <laughs> oh, one fell in. That's good. Um, and so uh, I'll give like a little bit of an overview of um, sort of like the technical background of, of uh, Valoran. And so um, from the beginning, like we, we started working on an engine mid-2018, um, and then at the end of 2018, uh, they like the, the core team rewrote that engine from scratch. They learned a lot of from like the mistakes of like what worked well, what didn't work. And so in the, the current version that we have, I'm gonna fall in lava. Okay, so yeah, lava does still kill me. I think that, that must be a bug because I swear I have like admin stuff on, but who knows? But we'll hang it in the village for a bit. But um, some of the big names that we use for, for crates, we use um, Specs as our entity component system. We use WGPU as our rendering backend, which we love. We work very closely with the uh, the authors of WGPU. Um, sort of like uh, I know some of our developers are contributing to WGPU, and we're able to use it. And um, for WGPU, I mean, it's like a, a great study to show that like we are like yeah. like for what they are creating, they want to make an entire graphics stack in Rust, and we're able to use it. And so I, I particularly love WGPU, but I really really like Naga as well, just because like when I was at the the Rust Game Dev Meetup where Quark gave a, a talk on it, and it was really awesome to me to see like shader translation done in Rust and faster than how C plus plus does mm -hmm. in certain cases. And so um, yeah. so a lot of WGPU. Um, I, we, we have like a ton of grace that we use, so I won't go through everything. But um, and we wrote some of our own stuff. But it's really crazy how far the ecosystem is along for for Rust game development in particular. Like game engines are still being worked on. So Bevy's really big right now. Amethyst is pretty mature. There's there's a few others out there. Um, but it's really possible to build uh, stuff like this nowadays. Yeah. Sweet. And I think it's so. It, it must be so inspiring for anyone who aspires to create something of their own to see something like yours out in the to see something like the Lauren out on the in the wild and I guess also the fact that it's open source and everybody can see the uh, the crates and everything and kind of get an idea or maybe even contribute that's that's so cool that is so yeah. so cool and so education wise this is one of our massive goals is that we really want people to be able to come in and learn about rust and learn about how things can be done with entity component systems um, and especially since like parallelism in games is really not as prevalent as it could be in this day and age where our cpus have like 12 cores and so um being able to explore this a lot um being able to explore like graphics uh, stuff in rust and so like, one of our big goals is we like for us we want to become an entity that's like a non-profit that focuses a lot on education through our blogs through helping new contributors, through making videos. Um, 
And so Zester just uh, mentioned that I can check with the waterfall over here, waterfalls over here, which I, um, waterfalls were actually merged in a feature branch called uh, called shrubs. And so it was like a, a little <laughs> poopy little thing to get into the game, but they're very cool. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think like, yeah, I just, actually, wait, yeah, maybe I can glide down. I don't know what I'm doing, not gliding. Okay, very cool. I think I think gliding on the stream might not come through as well. It's, it's very fun to do in, in game. Trying to think if there's uh, other items. We got giant trees in the game. Actually, let, uh, let me see if I can quickly find one on a map. Uh, if I look for giant trees, and I look if there's one. While, while you're looking for one, I just want to say that someone on the chat just said that the Aurora Borealis was kind of like the the equivalent of finding one of the dragons in Breath of the Wild. Like that just kind of, for the first time, that kind of breathtaking of like, what's going on in the sky? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think a lot of it as well is like this, you can create a lot of senses of wonder when you have things in video games that people haven't seen before. And so, mm -hmm. or just not what they were expecting or something like that. And this is definitely, yeah. um, when we look at the clouds, when we look at like gliding, um, we want people to be like, oh, they have gliding in this game, that's okay. But then they're at the top of the mountain, they pop their glider on and they glide down and they're like, wow, this is actually like really amazing. <laughs> that, uh, yeah. like, it, it looks like this and everything. Um, and so definitely like, uh, where, like, I mean, when we have new developers come in with these ideas of things that they think would be amazing to see, um, we love working our best to uh, to try and get them implemented, um, just because it really is magical when you can like see a lot of these super interesting things in game that you weren't uh, you wouldn't expect. Yeah, and I think also having a wide uh, like a diverse team helps you create that sense of wonder for different people, right? Because someone might be like, "Oh, I've played Skyrim with mods. I've seen the Aurora Borealis, yeah, whatever." Yeah. But you know, maybe something else uh, that someone else created might be. Yeah, very cool yeah, one. Absolutely, and so I think especially like with artists who come in with people who come in with like different ideas, like our tree, tree, uh, tree generation system um, came recently from a developer who wanted to like see procedural trees done in a different way. Now I think we're gonna have like a surprise get rendered here moment. Oh, wait, that was over here. Oh, okay, interesting. So this <laughs> giant tree is actually half underwater, which is very cool because sometimes we also have um, uh, campfires when underwater, which is, uh, um, it, it's like one of those like little uh, Easter eggs sort of that is still the fact that we are an alpha game and like we don't have all the bugs uh, solved yet. But um, this this is one of the uh, the giant trees. This is, this is pretty cool. I don't know if there's any others that spawned on the map. Um, yeah, and so I uh, we do have I guess we do have some castles and stuff that are implemented as well. Um, with a lot of the world simulation system, we have a lot of like backend system set up. So for example, we have like the economy between towns working quite well. And so this works nicely when you're trying to trade with characters. Like you can go to like a merchant and trade and like the value of their goods will be relative to like the economy of that city and the towns around it. Um, but then it, there are still ways that we want to tie a lot of this um, uh, like world simulation and real time simulation into what the, the player experiences through quests, through story, through reasons that history exists. And so I think if anybody's familiar with like Dwarf Fortress, one of the really big concepts in Dwarf Fortress is this idea of like hundreds of years of history in, in towns yeah. and like story that's created and stuff. And so I'm um, mm. really wanting to explore that idea is really cool. I wonder because you've taken so much care into um, kind of the geographical surroundings of the towns, will that also play into the commerce? Something, sorry, I've been, I've been like my, the mind juice is flowing yes. about like you were talking about commerce and I'm like, maybe certain towns will trade seashells and you know, this kind of stuff. Like, is there any of that? <laughs> All right. Um, as Esther just mentioned, if I, if I PP, is that, uh, okay. Um, no, I think my, oh, there's a better giant tree over here. Okay. So, um, we have, uh, I, I'm, I really like this idea of like, um, or rather, like I get the same thing. Like mind juice is going when you're when you're like, okay, there's economy between towns, and you're like, how cool can that be? Um, well, it, like what we're trying to do is make it very, very cool. And so, in some of our recent, or not recent, but like blog posts a while ago, we would have like map renders that showed the trade routes between cities and showed like how they progressed over time. And so, um, what that also means is that for a town, let's say there's a town um, over here. So we got. Um, a, a town here, we got a castle over here, a town here. Well, this town is sort of like closer to the mountains. So maybe they'll be able to extract more resources from the mountains. Maybe that's like their history is that they're a mining town. 
maybe this town over here, they're really close to a few rivers. And so for them, they're a lot more fishing and they, they, they were able to like prosper because of that. Um, but then maybe there's a town in the desert and it's like a really small town because it didn't have that, like the same resources available to it. And so definitely like playing with these ideas. I mean, when you're doing it in um, like world simulation, like so ahead of time, um, you can generate a ton of history uh, up front, sort of that you can base a lot of stuff off of. But then while the game is running, you also want to be able to interact with that history. And so, for example, um, exploring ideas of like what happens if like raiders come and attack a town. Um, how does that attack, like affect the, the town's economy? How does it affect the, the people that live in the town? And so there's a lot of ideas around this going on. And so definitely some some very smart people on the project uh, project working on that. So cool. Oh, that sounds so cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I start playing right away. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, for me, exactly. it's like I wanna I wanna contribute. I'm like I'm gonna yeah, <laughs> connect. Absolutely. And I mean, for anybody who wants to, I mean, there's so many different things that we we have contributors for. So we have people working on art assets who do like voxel modeling. We have people come in who do, uh, like want to fix issues, who find it like really cool that maybe our servers are working in a certain way and they want to optimize it. We actually had someone come in recently who uh, wants to improve our generation of, or like our, our binary generation system for building for the Raspberry Pi. And so uh, they've been working a lot recently on like targeting uh, like, um, ARM architectures, I think. And so mm -hmm. uh, it is super cool the people that we have come in because it's like, like it's an open source product. Nobody's making money off of it. If you find it cool, then why would you not contribute, right? And so um, for us, there's just like so much reason to uh, to have this community who are like inspired by what, what we're doing and what we're trying to accomplish and want to bring their own experience to it. Amazing. Um, yes. So I think sadly our time is up um, I, I was scared of that. I love talking. I, you know, I, I can talk for hours, but I'm, unfortunately, it must come to an end. I know, but it was such a great insight uh, into Valoran. And like, yeah, I'm just like, yeah, either play it or contribute to it or just like, you know, what you played for like, I think you're doing like release playthroughs or like something like that. Um, all the stuff. Very, very cool. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, same. I, I was having an eye on the clock, but I'm like, can we go over though? Because this is amazing. <laughs> uh, yeah, but thank you so much. Um, you know, will will people find you on the chat, or or where can where can people go find you to have more of a chat? Maybe maybe you find your next contributor in yeah, Matrix sure. or. <laughs> So for us, we are mainly on Discord. Uh, you can find our Discord. If you just look up Valoran on Google, go to our main website. Everything will be there. Um, we, we're trying to do coding uh, reading clubs together. So we're actually going through the code base to get new contributors Sweet. going. Um, and yeah, we'd love to see people come in and chat with us and uh, tell us that you you were here at, uh, at RustFest. Great. We're so glad you were here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. thank you so much. And with that being said, awkward silence. Um, it's okay. I got gameplay. <laughs> and now they, I was like mesmerized by the gliding. I'm yeah. sorry. Oh, try it maybe, out. It, like maybe we just fade this out, and then um, I will see like the viewers at home for our next session in a couple of minutes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>